Good. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Michael, not Melinda, but she's there. Um, and tonight, we're going to be talking about sex evolution and sex education. We have our fun title, This is How We Do It. And by we, we in principle mean science and science educators, or scientists, rather. Um, and so let's get started. So my first point, my first claim is that sex is everywhere. And I don't think that this is particularly controversial. Um, but I don't mean this in the sort of curmudgeonly, grandmotherly sort of way. I mean this in that if you go out into nature, you can observe the effects or the act of sex uh, pretty much uh, all around you. Um, this is, of course, a picture of a plant uh, attempting to have sex. These are damselflies having sex. And this is an anole signaling with his dewlap, um, probably trying to have sex. Um, and so it's pretty clear that sex is this very important thing in the natural world. But not only is it very common, but it's also very diverse. And here what I'm showing you is a cartoon tree of life. So things that are sort of more closely located to each other are more closely related, like birds and reptiles. And the pie charts underneath each one of these groups represents the mode of sex determination, or to be uh, precise, how individuals of these different species determine if they're going to be male or female, and each color encodes a different way of doing it based on either the environment or their genetics. And the main point I'm trying to show here is that it's not very consistent. All across the tree of life, there's tons of different ways of doing it. And so this gives us sort of two major questions to tackle. One is, why do so many things have sex? And two is, why does variation in how these things have sex persist? And this may seem like a sort of a paradoxical set of goals, because we're trying to explain both why sex is very common and why sex is different. But it turns out that if we have a good enough mental framework to tackle both of these problems, we can answer both of them in sort of one fell swoop. And uh, though now I guess is a good time to mention that I'm a first year graduate student at the evolutionary biology program at Harvard. So the framework we're going to use, coincidentally, is evolutionary biology. And I have sort of my favorite quote from my hero here, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And this sounds very dramatic. Um, and that's because it is. And but that doesn't have any bearing on it <laughs> not being true. And this was uh, the title of an essay by Theodosius Dobzhansky, who's a very famous population geneticist. Um, yes, and so to get started, we're going to need a very precise language to talk about sex, because trying to explain things is sort of useless um, if, you don't, if we don't have a good uh, dialogue, if we can't communicate. So in that aim, we're going to try to define what does sex mean to scientists um, at work. I mean, scientists not at work are people too, but we're, we're going to need a slightly more uh, rigorous definition. And in that vein, we're actually going to have to start all the way at the cellular level. So for those of you who've taken some biology relatively recently, this might be a review. For those of you who haven't, I'll try to make sure I explain everything. Um, and if you have questions, there'll be a few question stops along the way. So cells can divide in a couple of distinct fa fashions. One of them is mitosis. And to illustrate what mitosis is, I have this cartoon of a cell. So it's got two copies of its one chromosome. And that means it's diploid. So it has two copies of all of its genetic information. We're all diploid. So this is sort of the natural state of the vast majority of the cells in your body. And when a diploid cell wants to replicate and stay diploid, it's going to duplicate all of, its, uh, all of its genetic information. So now it has two copies of each of these. Then it's going to split. And now we get two copies that are identical to the first. And this is a very important process because this is how we all grow. Um, one can imagine when, if you're growing from being a child to an adult, you can get bigger in two ways. Your cells could get larger, or you can get more cells. Um, one of those is, is, is not the way it works, and one of them is mitosis. So that is how all the cells in your body replicate and replace themselves, or most of them. Um, the other way that a cell can divide is called meiosis. And 
we're still going to double all the information in the cell. Then something funny is going to uh, is going to happen, which I've illustrated by mixing the colors in these chromosomes. I'll get to that later. But then we're going to divide again, and now we've ended up with four cells. And you'll notice that each one of these has half the amount of information as, as it started out with. There's only one sort of chromosome lozenge in there. Um, and so these cells are haploid. So diploid is two copies, haploid is one. And so now we can have some sort of more precise definition that sex is the mixing of genetic information that occurs when haploid cells fuse. Um, and these haploid cells we'll call gametes. And so here's my little cartoon of, of sex. If, you know, two cells that love each other very much come together, and you end up with this diploid cell again. You'll notice it has the same number of uh, chromosomes as in that diploid cell we started out with. And now is a time uh, when I feel like I need to mention something very important. Uh, I'm only going to be talking about genetic sexes here. This is very much not the same thing as gender identity. Um, uh, I guess gender, I gender identity is a fascinating topic in and of itself, but that's not my area of expertise, so uh, I won't be touching on that very much today. And so here's this, uh, we now have a follow-up question. What do the sexes mean? Now that we know what sex is, what are the sexes? And it turns out that in biology, male and female just describes the size of the gamete. So for humans, for example, we have the small male gamete, the sperm, and the large female gamete, the egg. And that's all we mean when we say male or female. There's no other characters that we're referring to. Um, and you can imagine that because between us, that's because between us and a lizard, there's not many other secondary sexual characteristics we can take advantage of to try to define something. Um, lizards don't breastfeed their young, for example. Um, lizards don't have hair. So there's all these other characteristics that may be convenient for describing um, sex in sort of an offhand way in humans, but they're simply not precise. And so we will, in fact, use the correct definition instead. Uh, and uh, one other part that we need to motivate is, are there actually unanswered questions that we care about? Um, and of course, I'm going to say yes, but I hope that by the end you'll believe me as well. And in fact, there's a lot of questions about sex in a variety of different fields that are still discussed today. So evolution is what I'm going to talk about. Why did sex evolve? Um, there's game theory, or sort of math, or how are sex ratios optimized? That's ratios between males and females. In education, how do we teach sex ed? How does sex influence interpersonal dynamics? And of course, many more. I'm sure all of you can think of questions about sex that I haven't written up here that are still novel and interesting. So since I'm going to be talking about sex evolution, I'm going to have a, a roadmap for where I, what I will be talking about. The first question I want to tackle is, why does sex exist? That's sort of the fundamental. Uh, we'll definitely need that in order to progress further in this discussion. Second, I want to talk about why do sexes exist? Why, do, why is there not one biological or genetic sex? Why are there not a million? Um, and third, I want to talk about how are these sexes determined? Uh, I showed you that plot earlier showing that there is a great amount of diversity in how sex determination works. Um, and I want to motivate why that might be and how these systems work. So to start out with, uh, yes, sex is an evolutionary conundrum. And what I mean by that is it's, it's actually not trivial to explain why sex exists. Um, and so the follow-up question there is, what's the problem with sex? Why not? Why, well, you know, why is there something to explain? And the, the fact of the matter is uh, males are expensive. Males are kind of an, a waste in some sense. And what, what I mean by that is that if you have a sexual system with males and females, there's something called a two-fold cost of sex. Now, to illustrate this, I'm going to have two populations drawn in cartoon form up here. One is going to be an asexually reproducing female, and another is going to be a sexually reproducing population of males and females. And I'm going to say, I'm going to have a constraint that every reproductive event generates two offspring. Exactly. So let's step forward one generation. In the asexual population, it's, we've doubled the population size. Now there's, you know, in this new generation, there's two females. 
In the sexual population, we had to generate a male and a female, so there's still two individuals. And notice we've even given the sexual population an advantage, uh, since it starts with two individuals rather than one. If we go another generation, this problem just gets more and more pronounced. And sort of, it's, it seems that the sexual population should over, uh, the, sorry, the, uh, the asexual population should overwhelm our sexual population, because it's growing much faster. And it seems like our sexual population would eventually, you know, potentially be lost or get wiped out. Um, so why then does sex exist? And now I'm going to touch on something I hinted at earlier, you know, what's happening when these chromosomes get jumbled up in this middle step. And that, well, that process is called recombination, which is the mixing of genetic information. And it turns out that sexual reproduction promotes recombination. Um, because you have to have these, this fusing of these meiotically generated cells, uh, you have to have meiosis. And when you have to have meiosis, you have to have recombination, et cetera, et cetera. And in addition, you mix information from the two individuals that, uh, or perhaps one, that are having sex. And so you'll notice in this you know, abbreviated cartoon that I have started with two individuals, one with a blue-red genome, one with a green-yellow genome. I've had them generate some uh, gametes. I've picked one of, from each randomly. Then I've mated them. And now I've gotten an individual that has a totally different genome compared to either parent. And this can't happen in your sort of clonal, asexual model, where something is just replicating itself. Um, and so what's, what is so good about that? Um, well, to explain that, I'm going to in, need to introduce one more uh, bit of notation. And that's these little stars, which I will use to denote beneficial mutations which are changes to your DNA that improve your fitness, which is the, just the number of offspring you have in the next generation. So if you get a mutation that lets you have twice as many kids, that would get a little star on your, on your genome in this little cartoon. So let's imagine we have two asexual populations, one of, and each of which has two beneficial mutations. We're going to step through a few generations just like we did in the previous model. After one generation, they duplicate. Another generation, they duplicate again. But you'll notice there's been no change in the number of beneficial mutations in any given individual. And so the only way to get a new beneficial mutation into these guys is if they just spontaneously have, these, have a mutation, which is a very rare event. However, if we have a sexual system and we mate uh, these two guys, with some probability, we can get all of our beneficial mutations in a single individual. And so this individual is now much more fit than uh, it, its parents. And what that does is allows uh, populations to adapt uh, faster. And I should mention that sex will also generate this poor fellow who has none of the beneficial mutations present in the background. Um, and that's just sort of, uh, that's the cost of doing business. Uh, it, sex will generate these more variant um, fitnesses, but in terms of sort of evolutionary time, this guy doesn't really matter. So we're not gonna worry about him anyway. Yeah, sorry. So just to recap, um, sexual reproduction likely evolved to facilitate recombination, because if you have sexual reproduction, you are having this recombination process over and over again. And, increasing the, and what this does is increase the rate of adaptations, which can overcome this twofold cost of sex. So even though you're generating sort of fewer individuals um, per individual, you can adapt faster and thus outcompete um, these asexual populations. So we've answered um, this first question, why does sex exist? Why did it evolve? Why does it persist? Uh, and actually at this time, I'd like to see if anyone has a question. I'm happy to take one or two um, before the next section. Anyone? If not, we'll just forge on onward. Okay. So next we're gonna be talking about 
why are there sexes? Um, and of course, so our previous model did not mention sexes at all. Uh, we had the males and the females, but I treated them identically. Uh, well, I treated their <laughs> reproductive cells identically. And this is a scenario called isogamy. Iso just meaning same. Uh, and this is sort of very much not the case in humans. You know, egg and sperm are very different. They're sort of, they, one of them is very large, one of them is very small, one of them is much more mobile. And that scenario is called anisogamy, uh, where the male gamete is small again compared to the larger female gamete. And this is what, I guess, like, humans do. And so it turns out to explain why sexes exist, we first need to explain why anisogamy exists. Um, and sort of luckily, this will give us why there are sexes sort of for free. Um, and the fundamental motivating question here is, what are good traits for a gamete to have? And there's sort of two things that a gamete wants to optimize, mobility and mass. You want to be very mobile so you can find your partner or avoid predation. Um, avoiding predation is less of a big deal in humans, but there are many sort of marine animals that just sort of spray their gametes into the water. And that's sort of a great meal if you're another small uh, marine creature. So if you're able to move quickly, you can avoid getting eaten. And large mass just allows the offspring to have more resources when they start out. And this increases their chance of surviving. So we want to optimize mobility and mass at the same time. And so to use an analogy, isogamy is a bit like only having sporks. So you still need two gametes. And if both of your gametes are identical, it's quite a bit like trying to eat your dinner with two sporks as opposed to a fork and a spoon. And uh, I don't think it's too controversial to say that it's, generally speaking, easier to eat with a fork and a spoon rather than two sporks. And we'll consider this fork and spoon ideal to be sort of mass optimization and mobility optimization. And of course, your spork is the sort of thing that is in between. It's not very massive, it's, but it's not very, uh, and it's not very fast, but it's sort of like, big enough and fast enough. But the spork has a problem in that it can't become more spoon-like without becoming less fork-like, and it can't become more fork-like without becoming less spoon-like. So if you're going to get two utensils anyway, you might as well take a spoon and a fork rather than two sporks. Um, and that's sort of exactly what's happening here. Um, by having one gamete be very small and one gamete be very large, you can have your fork slash sperm, you can have your spoon slash egg, and this just, much like uh, eating dinner, is much more optimal than having two things that are the same. And so anisogamy allows for more specialization, and this explains why most organisms have two biological sexes, but not all, um, because they're trying to optimize these two criteria. If there were four criteria, maybe we'd have a slightly different scenario. But there's two major criteria, and the easiest way to optimize that is to have two different varieties. So now we have some idea about why there are different sexes. Um, and the very, or I guess our last question is, how do we then determine what sex individuals uh, are? And so we've answered the second question. And again, I will open it up just to see if anyone has something to ask. All right, great. And we'll move on to our third core question, which is how are these sexes determined? So uh, sex determination happens in many different ways. And sex determination is just this process through which an individual develops sexual characteristics, develops them to perhaps a male or a female, or uh, uh, I guess develops the machinery required in order to generate a certain gamete. Um, and in humans, sex determination occurs via an XY system. However, this is definitely not the case across all living things. So what is an XY system? Well, in XY systems, 
there are two sex chromosomes, an X and a Y. If you have two Xs, you develop as a genetic female. If you have an X and a Y, you develop as a genetic male. And that's because the Y has a masculinizing gene represented by this blue spot here. And so the default state is that you are a female. And if you have this masculinizing gene, it turns you male through development. Um, and this is, so this is why humans, uh, this is why human males are generally uh, XY genetically and human females are generally XX genetically. Of course, there are many, many caveats, but um, this is sort of the simplest form of the system. And as I showed earlier, sex determination happens in many different ways. So humans are, uh, as I'm sure you all know, mammals. So here we are. Uh, the red is XY, so all mammals do XY. Um, but next we're going to touch on birds, which are these blue spots. So they actually use a ZW system, which is just sort of essentially the opposite of an XY, in that the males are ZZ and the females are ZW. And as you might imagine, it just works in sort of the exact opposite as an XY system, where you're male by default and the W maybe has a feminizing gene on it that causes uh, the development of female features. So these systems are sort of much more easy to think about for us because they're very similar to how humans do it or they're exactly the same as how humans do it. Um, so we've done humans, we've done birds. What about the bees? And bees actually use a really sort of funky uh, sex determination system called haplodiploidy, which luckily we now have the vocabulary to deal with. And this means that the males are haploid, so these, this guy, while the females are diploid, this guy. And now we have this very weird system where the males have half the amount of genetic information as the females. Um, and this is substantially different than having a sex chromosome. Um, and, and there's various theories about why this may have evolved, although I won't get into that today. So th the fact that a system like this exists and systems like environmental sex determination or social sex determination, for example, there's species of fish that if there are no males in their sort of social group, the largest one will turn into a male. And if a larger male comes in, they can actually revert back to being female. And this seems like a much sort of better system because you can always optimize your sex ratio. You're never worried about having too many males or too many females or uh, something of that nature. Unlike, for example, in humans, if you sent 100 males to a deserted island with no contact with civilization, you're not going to get very many generations. Um, and that, so, that, so it seems like sort of a big disadvantage to have sex chromosomes. Yeah, so why have these specialized sex chromosomes in the first place? Um, and it turns out, uh, sort of unsurprisingly perhaps, that there's an evolutionary reason, uh, or an evolutionary hypothesis, I should say, why this exists. And it sort of lies in the fact that males and females experience different evolutionary pressures during life. Um, I also think that this is something that uh, we can all understand, at least from a social level. And these pressures also exist, um, I guess, at very basal like, genetic levels. And so the system I'll ask you all to consider is, imagine we get a mutation that's beneficial for males, but deleterious in females. And what I mean by that is, if you're a male and you have this gene, you're going to have more kids on average than a male that doesn't have this gene. But if you're female and you have this gene, you're going to have fewer kids on average than if you're female and do not have this gene. So there's some natural, what's called sexual antagonism going on. And as we've sort of discussed, recombination works to break up associations between genes. So with some probability, if an individual who has this male beneficial star locus and this masculinizing circle locus uh, together has offspring, Recombination will break apart those associations. And now, this male beneficial female deleterious allele, or gene variant, is separated from this masculinizing gene. 
And now, so that means that this gene can now end up in females, where it will be deleterious, as opposed to just being in males. And so sometimes these associations that recombination breaks apart are actually beneficial. So in this specific case, it would be ad advantageous to suppress recombination between the gene that makes you male and the gene that is beneficial if and only if you are male. And it turns out there's a chromosomal architectural mutation that can do just this. And it's called an in inversion. And as you might imagine, what an inver inversion does is it flips a bit of chromosome. So as you can tell, this chunk of chromosome has now been completely reversed with respect to the rest of the chromosome. And this is just sort of a mutation that can happen um, randomly. And it turns out that inversions allow sex-specific alleles to stay together by suppressing recombination within them. So you're still going to get, you still get the benefits of recombination, but what an inversion does is it disallows recombination within this region, so you can no longer break apart these genes. So this, this gene that's only good if you're male is now only going to show up in males. And you, might have, uh, you can imagine that this chromosome now has uh, an evolutionary advantage because it's generating males that are just better than the males that are being generated by a chromosome without this inversion. And it gets to avoid generating females that are just worse. And so this, uh, I guess, this hypothesis for why sex chromosomes evolved, um, called sexually antagonistic selection, uh, I guess, claims that over time you get more and more inversions along this chromosome, which lock up more and more of the chromosome and prevent more and more recombination until you have, uh, I guess, a specialized sex chromosome. So the Y in humans. And in fact, if you look at sex chromosomes throughout uh, living things, we can see some evidence for this. Uh, so there is some reason to believe me when I say that this might be why sex chromosomes exist. And you'll notice that I'm using sort of hedgy language. Um, and that's because we've sort of made it to the edge of what we know in this regard. Um, it, it, it's, it's very much the case that this is an active area of research that ma many people are looking into and have questions about still. And um, we've made it there in, in, in under a half hour, so good on you guys. And, it, and I guess also that goes to say that if you think that this might be an interesting system, go look at it. There's tons of questions waiting for you um, and your unique insights, I, I, I assume, um, in order to answer them. So finally, we've reached uh, the end of our three questions. We've answered why does sex exist. We've answered why are there different sexes. We've answered, um, well, in some cases, how sex is determined. And that leaves us with this last takeaway point that sex is really complicated. But it, it, while it is complicated, it's also fascinating. It's an interesting system that causes very interesting evolutionary consequences and allows for the application of lots of evolutionary thinking. And so sort of to segue into our next talk, um, it's, it's non-trivial to consider with something that's both complicated and admittedly somewhat taboo in society. How should we teach what sex is, how sex works, and what makes sex interesting? So on that note, um, I'll open it up to our final set of questions. Yes? Mm -hmm. Because it seemed the same except for the labels of male and female. Mm -hmm. And so, what definition are you presuming lets you independently decide these are the females and those are the males instead of vice versa? So then you can decide that it's an XY as opposed to a CW. Right. So, the question was. Um, how do we know that, uh, how can we tell ZW and XY systems apart when they're sort of mechanically the same except I've just switched the labels? And the, the reason that we can have these separate definitions is because we have this uh, other definition that the male gamete is the smaller one. 
So that lets us fix which sex is sort of the male, and that allows us to make this comparison with how the chromosomes uh, work. Yes? The, um, you're talking evolution, the evolution of sex. Is there any indication that you know, sex, when it first started to evolve, that uh, we've got to the point where the XY is some sort of continuation from a, an earlier development, or it's just something that just cropped up? OK, so the, the question is sort of, what is sort of the evolutionary history of X and Y? How did they come to be? Is that That's great? Um, so it's, it's a complicated story. And it turns out that sort of sex chromosomes evolve very rapidly, uh, or can evolve very rapidly. And just, I guess, sort of a, as an anecdote to, to demonstrate that platy I guess platypuses um, actually have a totally different sex chromosome system than uh, humans, even though they are mammals. And their sex chromosomes are actually, potentially, there's a paper that came out relatively recently, more closely related to birds than they are to ours. So there's a lot of variation. There's a lot of crazy evolutionary stuff going on. Um, in terms of how many times did, uh, I guess, anisogamy evolve? How many times did you get males and females? Um, that's evolved many times independently throughout the tree of life. Um, although we think that, uh, I guess, this so whole idea of meiotic sex probably evolved only once at the base. And asexual animals that you see today lost the ability to have sex, not the other way around. Yes? Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you have any ideas of like what what is the evolutionary benefit of having a system like that? So <clears throat> those systems can be uh, oh I guess the question was what's the evolutionary benefit of having sort of environmentally determined uh, sex? And I the answer again is sort of complicated. It depends on exactly how that environmental determination is working. But if you have um, a very stable environment, that system can often work a lot better than um, genetically determined sex chromosomes. And uh, it's also sort of easier to evolve in, in certain cases. So I guess the takeaway here is just that um, not everything is adaptive. Some things just sort of are the way they are due to history. Um, and other than that, we'd have to get, I guess, specific. You were saying that asexual organisms lost, the, lost the, the function of having sex, not the other way around. Is that, is that what you just said? Oh, sorry. So the, so the question is, um, what is the polarity of either sex gain or sex loss? Uh, I, should be, I should have been more precise. Um, asexual animals, like uh, whiptail lizards, where they're all female, they lost the ability to have sex. But things that, uh, I guess things that are more basal or closer, uh, you know, they branch off closer to the root of the tree of life, they may never have evolved sex in their evolutionary history. So not all asexual things had an ancestor that had sex. Right. So, so I guess uh, my question is uh, for the former that you mentioned, this mm -hmm. reptile, yeah, uh, these... that lost the ability to have sex. Is there a, a hypothesis for evolutionary benefit for losing sex? Yeah, so the question is, is there a reason why losing sex might be beneficial? And it's exactly that twofold cost of sex that I showed you. Um, in the short term, that's a, uh, if there's two populations of lizards and one of them loses the ability to, to have sex, it can grow much faster than this other sexual lizard population. However, asexual uh, animals tend to be sort of tips on the tree of life. So they don't last very long. So we think they're sort of evolutionary dead ends. But evolution is sh fundamentally short-sighted. So we get these asexual blips, like these whip tails. So we're kind of right now in this window of actually being able to see this, this reptile species. But, but if we were to project theoretically a million years uh, from now, we, were, we are assuming that they're not going to survive the test of time or evolution of time. Uh, it, well, most likely. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all very much. <laughs>
So hello, my name is Melinda McPherson. Um, I am currently a third year graduate student. I'm in the program for speech and hearing bioscience and technology. Um, so I study auditory neuroscience. I study hearing. Uh, so you might wonder why I'm giving a presentation on science and sex education. Um, and it's because on the, on the side, when I'm not at my day job in the lab, um, I'm a sex educator. So I became interested in sex education when I was an undergraduate. Uh, I started volunteering with a program called Creating Responsibility in Adolescent Sexual Health that provided weekly sexual health classes to incarcerated young men in the Maryland Department of Juvenile Justice. And more recently, I've been working uh, teaching a 16-week comprehensive sexuality education uh, to local eighth graders. So I've been teaching sex ed for about four years now. So today in this talk, I'm going to be discussing the role of science in discussions about sex, um, the current state of sex education in the USA, the science of studying sex education, so specifically how can we actually assess the effectiveness of sex education programs, what programs are actually most effective, and then hopefully I'll leave you with some takeaways. But first, let's start with some definitions. And it's, it has crashed. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so, uh, I'll revisit the definition of sex that Michael so beautifully laid out in the first half of this talk. Uh, Michael defines sex as a mixing of genetic information that occurs when haploid cells fuse. So again, you have these two haploid cells, and they turn into a diploid cell, and there it is. There's sex. But let's revisit this definition of sex, because in common parlance, sex is often used to refer to sexual activity. We don't often refer to two haploid cells fusing to form, or two, two yeah, haploid cells fusing to form a diploid cell when we're talking about sex in everyday discussions. And so this is sort of an intentionally vague description. Um, sexual activity is a pretty big umbrella term that can refer to any action performed with another person or with oneself or with multiple people um, for sexual pleasure. Another term that I'm going to be using a lot is uh, the term STI. So STI stands for sexually transmitted infection. Um, uh, so it's a, a, an infection that you can get through sexual contact. Um, STD stands for sexually transmitted disease. So um, I grew up hearing the term STD a lot, but now the term STI is used more frequently uh, because many sexually transmitted infections won't actually turn into diseases. So diseases are sort of, you have lots of symptoms. Um, for example, HIV, human uh, immunodeficiency virus, is an infection that leads to the disease AIDS. So often it's more appropriate to talk about sexually transmitted infections as a more general term. Okay. So now to the main focus, what is sex education? Um, before I start, I'll just say that sex education is something that we all have hopefully had some experience with. This is a kind of a personal topic. Um, as a show of hands, who thinks that they had a good sexual education? Okay, so it's a really small number. It's kind of a shockingly small number of people think that they actually had a good sex education. Um, and so as I go through this talk, try to maybe think back to your days of you know, sex ed um, and what that was like and what kind of education you received. There's something happening with the slides, but okay. Um, so when people think about sex education, often the first thing that they think about is abstinence only until marriage programs. These are sometimes called sexual risk avoidance programs and they, they teach abstinence as the single option for teenager. Teenagers, And so since abstinence is the only option, these programs don't generally teach any information about contraceptives and STI prevention. Okay. This is in contrast to sexual health education, which is again kind of an umbrella term for programs that cover the basics of anatomy, reproduction, contraception, and STI prevention. Finally, under the umbrella of sexual health education is comprehensive sexuality education. These are programs that cover a range of topics related to reproduction, anatomy, pregnancy, contraception, puberty, sexual orientation and gender identity, relationships, personal skills, communication, decision making, sexual health such as STI prevention and treatment, society and culture, so sexuality in the media, gender roles, etc. So why do we have sex ed at all? It's often because parents don't necessarily want to teach their kids all of these topics. 
And um, so it's sort of up to schools and other programs to educate people about these. Um, and also, this is a public health issue. Health is up here a lot. Um, sexual health, uh, reproduction, these are health issues that people should be informed about. Okay. okay. And then one thing I'll say is we often think of sex education as for you know, teenagers, people who have just hit puberty, um, but sex education is actually for all ages. So this is an infographic from the Boston Public School System, and they actually have a sexual health curriculum that starts in kindergarten and grade two, go, and, grade two um, and goes up through 12th grade. And of course, the topics that are covered for kindergartners are very different from the topics covered for high schoolers. Um, in kindergarten, you might be discussing body boundaries and anatomy. And in grades 9 through 12, the discussion turned to things like sexual, uh, STDs, consent, um, protection methods, etc. So something that I notice when I look at this uh, range of topics up here is that most of them are related to science. There are a lot of science topics involved in teaching sexual health. In order to understand STI treatment and prevention, for example, you need to know something about science. Um, and as a sex educator, I get asked tons of questions about sex every single week. And um, my favorite kind of question to answer are the science questions. And students ask a lot of these. So for example, they might ask, why do humans have sex? And you just heard the answer to that. And they might ask a question. Sorry, the slides are jumping. Um, what is the difference between a, a viral and a bacterial infection? And I'll pause for a second on this question. This is a question I get all the time. And so when students ask this question, they generally want two answers. They first want to know what infections that I've heard of or haven't heard of are viral, and which infections are bacterial. So on the left here, I have a list of the most common viral infections, including um, HIV, which I've mentioned, hepatitis, human papillomavirus, herpes, and Zika. Um, and on the right, I have uh, three of the most common bacterial infections, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. So they want to know which infections are which, which are viral and which are bacterial, and they also want to know what happens if I get one of these. And so it's critical to tell, tell these students that um, if you have a bacterial infection, you can cure that infection. You can take antibiotics and the infection will go away. However, if you have a viral infection, you can treat that viral infection, you can make it so that you no longer have any symptoms, but that virus will likely be hiding in your body cells for the rest of your life, and you could have outbreaks later in life. But you can treat most of these viruses, and you can lead a normal, healthy life uh, if you have these, but they'll never fully leave your system. So that's a critical difference. So that's usually the answer that student wants, a student wants when they ask this question. But as a scientist, I'm always trying to say, how can we get more science into here? And we can, I could sort of add to this, uh, to this question that there's actually bacterial and viral are not the only two types of infections you could get. You could get trichomoniasis, which is caused by a protozoan. You could get pubic lice or crabs, which is caused by an insect, or scabies, which is caused by an arachnid. You could go even further and talk about what is actually the difference between a virus over here, this is, her, um, this is herpes, and a bacteria over here, this is syphilis. And then this, you know, this crab looks very different, but what are all the differences between these organisms? Why can you not treat this infection, but you can treat these two infections? So science is a critical part of sexual health education. Um, in order to understand the difference between a, a, vi um, a virus and a bacteria fully, you need to know some science. And so sort of conversely, um, you can, sexual health can be a great way to teach people about viruses and bacteria. So with that, how is sexual health actually taught in the USA today? I'm going to start with a bit of a pop quiz. So how many states require some form of sexual health education? Is it A, 18, B, 24, or C, 41? So let's get hands up for A. OK, all right. You guys aren't very optimistic. Let's get some hands up for B. OK. Hands up for C. OK. So the answer is 24 states. So up here in blue, um, so a minority of states. Um, uh, states that require sexual health education are in light blue. And states that do not require sexual health education are in dark blue. 
So you might notice, for example, that Massachusetts is one of these states that does not require sexual health education. But I showed you a graphic from at the beginning of the presentation from the Boston Public Schools. So individual districts within all of these states can require sexual health education and can have really you know, uh, uh, comprehensive sexuality uh, education curricula. But um, in Massachusetts, it's not required that any school district pr provide any form of sexual health education. Now, this is not necessarily the best metric. It tells us where sexuality education is required. It doesn't tell us anything about how good it is. So, follow-up question. How many states require that, if provided, sex education be medically, factually, or technically accurate? So, for example, mandating that curricula be based on information from peer-reviewed journals, etc. Is it A, 13, B, 23, or C, 34? Let's get hands up for A. Who thinks A? Okay, who thinks B? Who thinks C? Okay, I primed you all. It is 13 states, unfortunately. Um, so um, only, so the, again, the states in light blue require that um, sex education be medically or factually accurate. The states in dark blue have no requirements. And these, um, these uh, requirements actually vary quite a bit. The medical accuracy requirements vary quite a bit between states. Um, so, for example, Hawaii um, passed a law recently and they defined medically accurate um, is sort of verified or supported by research conducted in compliance with accepted scientific methods. And they actually, in the law, they name specific journals that the research should be based on. So, you know, the Ameri American Academy of Pediatrics, their journal, the um, American uh, College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists. So, journals and, and studies that are sort of sanctioned by these professional organizations. Other states on here, so Hawaii is one of those states with medical accuracy laws. Um, Rhode Island uh, is another state that has a medical accuracy law, but this is a law that was passed in the 80s at the height of the AIDS epidemic. And it basically just says that the school board needs to work with medical professionals to make sure that their curricula are accurate and then give no further guidance for what that actually means. So these laws do actually vary quite a bit from state to state. As a side note, um, there was a law going through the Massachusetts state legislature uh, last year to make um, sexual health education mandatory and hopefully medically accurate, and that was part of the, the law, um, and it's currently in the House Ways and Means Committee, so it's progressing. So hopefully we'll flip this state. Um, okay, so science is not always mandated to be present in sexual health education curricula, unfortunately. Take a quick break. Are there any questions so far? So um, that's a great question. I don't know the. Oh, sorry. The question was, how come California doesn't uh, require sex education but requires that it be accurate? I actually don't know the specific law. Laws mandating sexual health education come with um, sort of financial constraints. And so if you're going to mandate sexual health education, you need to provide a lot of funding for that education. But to mandate that it's accurate when you teach it doesn't necessarily require funding. So there might be a differential there. That would be my guess, but I don't know the specifics of California. I just know that a lot of these times these laws are sort of um, uh, stopped by funding issues. Any other questions? OK. Oh, yes. At what age do children mature a like, sexual conception? Well, uh, so most, um, a lot of sort of more comprehensive sexuality programs will uh, suggest starting sexual health education around age six. Um, but again, it has to be age appropriate. So at that time, kids are really trying to figure out their own bodies and trying to figure out boundaries. Um, and so they won't really have necessarily a conception of what sex is, but they will have a conception of um, of the fact that they have a body, that there's sort of parts of their body that uh, they don't quite understand. Um, and so uh, basically being unafraid to um, address six-year-olds as sort of sexual beings, because humans are sexual from the time they're born to the time they die, um, and being able to sort of engage with them on a level that's appropriate. Um, so yeah, people do say as early as six, just trying to get kids um, thinking about their body, about gender, um, and these issues. Okay, so um, before, before this slide, we were look, talking about um, how not every state mandates um, that sexual health education be accurate. But I'm kind of going to flip this question. 
If we're teaching sexual health education at all, how do we know that it's having an impact? How do we actually know that sexual health education is, um, is uh, doing what it's supposed to do, or what is it supposed to do? Um, so is there a science behind sex education? The answer is, of course, yes. Um, the goal of sexual, sexual health education and outreach is to change behavior. Um, so I have an example of sort of an early um, campaign against, uh, at the time, STIs were called venereal diseases. This is from the Second World War, and it was trying to change the behavior of the, uh, members of the Air Force to stop the spread of STIs. And so they were basically saying, sex exposure without prophylaxis is pro-axis. Um, it will help the enemy if you don't use um, <laughs> barriers to prevent STIs. So people try to, a lot of the point of sex education is to try to change people's behavior to, um, to basically improve public health. But changing behavior is really, really hard. I'll give kind of the non-controversial example of hand washing. So a recent study in Minnesota said that, showed that 97% of women and 92% of men think that washing your hands after going to the bathroom is good and healthy and should be done. But only 75% of women and 58% of men uh, said that they regularly do wash their hands after going to the bathroom. So even when people know that something is good for them, it'll improve their health, they don't always follow through. So changing behavior is really, really difficult. Um, so how effective can we expect sex ed to be? Is it actually effective at changing people's behavior? In order to examine this question, <coughs> excuse me, um, we have to come up with experiments. We have to test things as scientists. Um, and so in any scientific experiment, you'll have something called the independent variable, which is the thing that the experiment changes, and the dependent variable, which is an outcome that changes as a result of the independent variable. And when studying sex, um, sex ed, sex education, um, the independent variable is usually the type of sex education class. So is it abstinence only? Is it sort of a basic sexual health class? Is it a more comprehensive sexuality education? Um, and then the de dependent variables that you can measure are quite varied. Uh, often what's used is unintended pregnancy prevention. So teen pregnancy is used as a metric quite frequently to measure effectiveness. STI transmission is also used as a metric. Uh, condom use, reported condom use, um, and age at sexual debut are all used as metrics for how effective these programs are. And there have actually been a lot of studies looking at the effectiveness of sex education programs, but many are inconclusive. And there's, in a sense, a simple reason for this. These dependent metrics aren't very good. Um, it's often really difficult um, or impossible to measure these dependent uh, var variables. So I said that teen pregnancy is often used as a metric, and there's kind of a simple reason why it's used as a metric. That data is easy to get. It's really easy to say, okay, this state had one kind of sex education program, and you can look through the birth records for that state and see how many births happened and how many of the moms are teen moms. So you can get that statistic. But there are a lot of other variables that will influence teen pregnancy in any given state or, or a county or town. And so it's not clear that this is always the best metric, but it's a metric that you can get. STI transmission might be a great metric. Are people actually using safe sex practices? Um, but it's also really hard to measure. So you have to rely on people telling you that they contracted an STI, um, which they might be unwilling to do. Um, you either, you, or you have to contest them yourself, which it might be hard to get people to come in for testing. Um, and even if people think they don't have an STI, like I said at the very beginning of the talk, many STIs actually don't have symptoms at first. You might not know you're infected. So it's really hard to measure STI transmission. Condom use and age of sexual debut will also sort of suffer from um, a bias in that experiment, uh, people, participants in a study might not, they might exaggerate their use of condoms, they might exaggerate their age at sexual debut. So you do have to rely on people giving you accurate answers. In addition to these problems, collecting any variables, these dependent variables, there are often many socioeconomic factors that influence the effectiveness of any given program. And it can be very difficult to pre perform random controlled trials. So you'd want to maybe split a town into two subsets of, of students and give them each a different um, sex ed curriculum, but that could be pretty hard to implement in practice. So these there have been a lot of studies. They're often inconclusive, but there are some takeaways. There are some things that we've learned about sex education. 
Um, and the thing I'd like to first start, well, start off with is that sex education is actually not that controversial. Um, we think of sex education as something that could be very controversial, but a study that just came out this past summer shows that that's really not the case. So they polled, um, they tried to do a representative poll of about 1,600 parents from around the country. And they separated these parents by Republican and Democrat. And these were parents of middle school students. And with the over 89%, uh, uh, I guess, agreement, um, parents agreed that students should have access to information, students in middle school should have access to information about puberty, healthy relationships, abstinence, and STDs. There was a bit more of a division around birth control, over here in this, this line, and sexual orientation. But by the time these students get to high school, that divide starts to narrow. And the vast majority of parents want their kids to have access to all these topics. They want their kids to learn about puberty, healthy relationships, abstinence, birth control, STDs, and sexual orientation. So this is actually, sex education is not a very controversial topic. People want their kids to learn about these, these issues. So um, how effective are specific types of sex education? I'll start with abstinence-only education. There has been some federal research on abstinence-only education since there is federal funding for these programs. Federal funding for abstinence-only education in pink actually tripled between 1998 and 2006. And um, then in, by 2010, uh, funding for abstinence-based edu abstinence-only education had gone down and uh, funding for sexual health education that provides information about STIs, contraception, et cetera, had gone way up. And one of the reasons for this flip was actually a 2004 report that showed that 80% of federally funded abstinence-only programs taught information that was medically inaccurate. So for example, uh, it was found that many programs were teaching that HIV can be transmitted through tears or sweat, and there are no known cases of transmission through these fluids. There's uh, no known cases through any of these means, sweat, sneezes, bathing, sharing food, etc. cetera. Um, a 2010 study on the left showed that there is no empirical evidence that abstinence-only programs effectively reduce sexual behaviors, teen pregnancy, or STD rates. Um, uh, and so although there is, on the, on the right, although there is no evidence indicating that fu federally funded abstinence-only until marriage education is effective, a recent randomized controlled trial found that in specific cases, abstinence-only education programs that are specifically tailored to the local community can be in effective in delaying sexual debut among younger teens. So basically these programs are only effective if they're within a community context that supports abstinence only and um, students are sort of sur surrounded by this message. Uh, but otherwise there's no effect, that, uh, there's no indication of its efficacy. So in contrast, how do sexual health education and comprehensive sexuality education programs do? Um, a recent study from this year showed that students who had access to sexual health courses were more likely to visit a doctor about a sexual health issue and were more likely to use contraception. So this is important. If people have access to sexual health information, they're more likely to know if there's an issue or if they could have been exposed to an STI. And they're more likely to then go to a doctor and seek treatment. And this can help spread the further transmission of STIs. Importantly, a 2007 study showed that sexual, uh, sexuality education is not known to increase likelihood of risky sexual activities. A lot of parents are really worried that if their children get comprehensive sexuality education starting as early as age six, that maybe they'll know too much and they'll want to experiment and sort of bad, let's, let's keep the information about sex away from them. Um, but there's no indication that that's the case. In fact, giving sp students access to this information um, is generally associated with positive metrics. Um, but a recent meta-analysis showed inconclusive effects of school-based sexual health programs. Again, dependent variables are really hard to measure, so just a lot of these studies sort of showed kind of maybe positive indicators, but overall kind of null results. So it's easy to overstate the efficacy of sexual health programs. There are definitely some positive indicators, but a lot more research needs to be done. Okay, so I'll leave you with some takeaways. Um, science is a big part of sex education. While sexuality education is inherently personal and influenced by many social factors, there is a science underlying much of sexual health and decision making. 
It's important to know about the biology behind STIs in order to fully understand how to protect yourself or understand pregnancies so that you can choose a contraceptive method that's right for you. And science, both scientific research and scientific literacy, are critical for understanding many aspects of sexual health. And there is a science behind sexual health education, but the science is tricky and changing behavior is really hard. So there's indications that giving young people accurate information can change behavior. Um, there is some indication that sexual uh, health programs can help with decreasing teenage pregnancy race, uh, rates or increased use of condoms. Um, and critically, giving young people accurate information about sex will not increase the likelihood of risky sexual behaviors. So I'll leave you with the free resources. Um, Planned Parenthood has a great website that talks a lot about sex education. Um, the CDC has a great uh, page about sexual health, um, providing mainly information about STIs. Um, and one organization that was mentioned earlier and that I volunteer with, Fenway Health, it's a local um, Boston organization. Uh, they uh, have a uh, National LGBT Health Education Center. This is an issue that I didn't really touch on, but a lot of um, very vulnerable populations like LGBT indiv individuals are often left out of traditional sex education classes, and that's a whole other separate issue. Um, so with that, I'll leave any questions. We answered it all. <laughs> So, uh, so you mentioned studies have mostly been inconclusive. Mm -hmm. it, it is part of the problem is uh, most studies are kind of cross-sectional look, uh, and, and if so, do you, are there any studies that look like uh, forward, are forward-looking and like follow the cohort? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great um, question. So the question is, uh, a lot of the studies about sexual health are inconclusive, and why is that? Have studied, studies not been long-term enough? Um, so there, the studies are, like I mentioned, there are sort of, there's a lot of flaws with the metrics that are used um, to uh, sort of measure the efficacy of these programs. I mean, there's an inherent flaw in measuring um, sexual health programs in that often students are aging as they take these programs, and as they age, they're more likely to engage in sexual activity, and then they're more likely to con contract STIs. So an increase in STI rate among a cohort um, it, it doesn't necessarily tell you much because you don't know what the increase would have been had they not had the sexual health program. So even when there are longitudinal studies, it's a little bit hard to parse the data. I mean, I guess except yeah. if, you're, if you're taking another um, control or Ex Exactly, uh, exactly. If you're able to do a randomized control trial, which many people aren't, so uh, which one, many studies are unable to do. So actually, um, about three years ago, there was a big initiative uh, to, uh, to do, um, I think it was between 70 and 80 longitudinal studies of um, uh, sexual health in, in the United States, of evidence-based sexual health. And unfortunately, those studies were all just cut. So a quarter of a billion dollars of funding was just cut. And so none of those fundings will proceed past year three. None of those studies will proceed past year three. So now we'll never know actually how effective those 80 programs were. So there was a lot of research that was going to come to fruition in about two years. and. It's um, unfortunately not going to be available now. So, um, yeah, so hopefully in the future these studies will happen because they were in progress. But, yeah. Do you know if there are any programs? I noticed that a lot of your outcome, the outcomes that you talk about are biologically based. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there are any um, sexual health programs that are studied from sort of a psychosocial well-being perspective of like how do people sort of positively view their sexual schemas or. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the question was um, how uh, many of the metrics that I discuss are biological metrics, and are there any studies that look at more sort of social outcomes? And n unfortunately, not that I know of. Um, I, I don't, I, not that in my research I've come across any. Normally people do just sort of stick to the biological metrics. Um, but I sort of, as a sex educator, and um, I, I do feel like this, these issues are really tied up in self-esteem and body image, so um, it would be really interesting to look at those types of outcomes, because those are probably, um, they're really important as well. But I'm uh, sorry, I don't know the answer. Any other questions? OK. All right. Well, yeah, thank you very much. around if you want stick around if you want chocolate or to learn about STIs or both <laughs>
have exclusive. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>